you one we are live good evening to all welcome to this third edition of the tavi simplified webinar and uh, both the one the first and the second edition were successful over 1500 uh, attendees so today at the third session we have a very eminent faculty from around the world so i have uh, great pleasure to uh, ask or request dr murugan to start the session uh, today thank you dr sengolwer good evening my dear brothers and sisters today is the last webinar the interesting webinars were happening in the last two weeks there are more than 4000 5000 delegates attending this program really very happy to see so many physicians are now interested to learn about uh, tavi uh, uh, without wasting much time i have great pleasure in introducing the chair persons the eminent chair persons dr bashi can i have your slide can i have bashi's slide please yeah dr bashi is the director and senior consultant institute of cardiac and advanced aortic disease sims hospital chennai over a span of 36 years he has performed more than 15000 cardiovascular and thoracic surgeries pioneer in beating heart surgery and arterial grafting for coronary artery disease in india one of the most experienced surgeons in complex aortic aneurysm surgeries in india and has performed more than 1000 aneurysm surgeries this includes more than 400 aortic root replacements 150 aortic arch replacements thoracic and thoraco abdominal aortic operations hybrid procedures of the aortic arch and thoraco abdominal aorta a 2017 limbra award winner tamil nadu medical practitioners limbra award for eminent medical personality 2013 akmg emirates award and then 2013 indo australian award more than that he is the people's uh, surgeon all the patients uh, love him especially the uh, he is the, always does the cardiac surgery so he is heartily attached to every patient next i will be happy to introduce the dr hirmat is again cardiac thoracic surgeon from satya sai institute of higher medical sciences he is the secretary of the indian association of cardiovascular thoracic surgeons his interests are uh, uh, coronary fellowship training first in asia resident training program affordable cardiac surgery for developing countries home of graft banking biomedical innovation a great teacher and a great academician next i would be happy to introduce dr paul ramesh uh, from apollo hospital is a cardiac thoracic and vascular surgeon most number of heart and lung transplants in india most number of double lung transplants in india first successful bridge to heart transplant oldest patient to receive heart lung transplant in india was about 67 years second oldest in the world second successful double lung transplant in a patient with hermansky pulaski syndrome in the world world second heart lung and kidney transplant now i i have a great pleasure in uh, welcoming dr singo to well to introduce this first speaker over to you singo to well so uh, the first talk would be the current evidence uh, of tavi and the guidelines so i have, uh, now we have dr rahul sharma uh, dr rahul sharma is a clinical assistant professor of medicine attached to uh, stanford university uh, he's been one of the uh, uh, great operators of structural interventions and uh, he's been very active in academic uh, and uh, particularly in india uh, he was he, he was here with, with us for the india wales uh, 2019 and we have been collaborating with him frequently and uh, i have great pleasure in uh, inviting him and requesting him to talk today thank 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 you dr rahul please proceed thank you so much and thank you for the kind invitation to join it's a pleasure to be joining you all good evening to uh, all of the delegates uh, who are participating and watching so it's my great pleasure to talk to you this morning or this evening uh, on tavi and the current evidence and guidelines these are my disclosures And so we've seen a significant iteration in device evolution over the years and some or all of you may be familiar with some of these platforms as they've evolved over time. And this on the left is the Medtronic uh, core valve and now Evolute platform that's evolved over the last few years, particularly with the inception of the partner trial where Edwards has really set the scene for the development of valves and particularly the largest data set to guide valve therapy in aortic stenosis. And you can see on the panel on the right there the evolution of the Sapien valve platform and now what we have is the Sapien 3 Ultra platform and over the years there've been improvements not just in the device technology but also our operator experience and also in terms of the patients that we select 
as a result, over time, we've noticed an increase of improvement rather than clinical outcomes, a reduction in stroke risk, a reduction in mortality, a reduction in perivalvular leak, and a reduction in conduction disturbances. And so the combination of the improvements in device technology, our experience in patient selection, so too has resulted in improved clinical outcomes over time. But we haven't stopped there. There are new devices in development, and these are two devices, at least in the United States and Europe, that are undergoing trial and evolving. On the left here, you have the Portico Navitor system, which is a self-expanding device that's part of Abbott, uh, formerly St. Jude Medical. And on the right there, the accurate and neo-accurate devices, again, a self-expanding platform from Boston Scientific. And both of these are currently being assessed in clinical trials, and it's likely that they will receive FDA approval upon completion of the trial, bringing two additional valves into the ever-growing market. So the role today is to talk about guidelines and how guidelines have changed the 2020 uh, ACC AHA update to the guidelines. There were some significant changes. And so first and foremost, with regards to the timing of when to intervene, regardless of whether it's with SAVR or TAVR, of course, the first step is any abnormal aortic valve should be classified into the D1, D2, or D3 system. Patients who are symptomatic, if they have severe aortic stenosis and classified in stage D1, can undergo AVR, whether that be surgical or TAVI. And we'll go on to where the differentiation lies shortly. In patients who have uh, severe symptoms, but do not quite meet the criteria based on their velocity and valve area or gradient, then have an assessment of their left ventricle at systolic reserve. If they have a impaired systolic reserve and therefore reduced gradient, they're classified as D2, and they too meet class one criteria for replacement of the valve. The less common and somewhat controversial D3 with patients who have a preserved ejection fraction but still do not meet criteria based on their gradient um, and velocity. If there's a determination vaulted by a multidisciplinary heart team that the AS is the most likely cause of their symptoms, then they too receive a class one indication for intervention. The patients who are asymptomatic is somewhat a bit more difficult. And at the moment, we're running a trial in the US looking at, uh, at the patients who have asymptomatic severe AS, that's the early TAVA trial. But until the results of those are out, it's really determined by the velocity, the ejection fraction, the need for other cardiac surgery or intervention, or reduced exercise tolerance. And those patients may meet criteria for aortic valve replacement. Now, when we look at the intervention type based on risk, there's been a real significant change between the 2017 update to the guidelines and the 2020 guidelines. What you'll see highlighted here is that clearly, as we've all been practicing for quite some time, those patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis who are at high or prohibitive surgical risk, who have an acceptable life expectancy or quality of life that's greater than one year, and it's their patient preference, they should undergo TABI. If they don't have an expected quality of life beyond one year, then palliative care or medical management may be appropriate. And that's a class one indication for TAVI. The other group in whom TAVI is deemed appropriate in a class one indication is no longer just the patients who are octogenarians or older, as was the case in the 2017 guidelines, but really now a shift to patients who are above 80 with any risk status, not just higher prohibitive risk, but very importantly, expanding the indication to a younger, much lower risk group of patients, age 65 to 80 where you can see the TAVI shares the class one indication with surgical aortic valve replacement. And so to summarize this in a sort of key point, in 2017, surgical aortic valve replacement was recommended for symptomatic and asymptomatic patients who had severe AS who made, met an indication for AVR if they were at lower intermediate risk, with TAVI only being reserved for those who were high or prohibitive risk for surgery. Fast forward three years, and now TAVI is appropriate for symptomatic patients who have severe AS who are above 80 or for younger patients who have a life expectancy of less than 10 years, which depending on the country can be as young as 70 and no anatomic contraindication of transfemoral TAVR. And in that situation, TAVR is actually recommended in preference to surgical AVR. So a significant change in dynamics for the introduction of TAVR. When we look at valve and valve, which recently received approval, patients with bioprosthetic valve in those patients who are determined to be high prohibitive risk, so this is still the domain of high and prohibitive risk, not lower intermediate. In those patients who have a previous surgical prosthetic valve, TAVR is appropriate with a 2A indication. In patients who have dysfunction due to regurgitation rather than stenosis, similarly, they too have a class 2A indication for TAVI valve and valve if they meet high or, uh, or prohibitive risk criteria. Antithrombotic 
Therapy has been an issue of much debate and conjecture since the idea of lethal thickening and lethal thrombosis, particularly related to subclinical stroke was first introduced. And there've been a number of trials looking at different regimens of antiplatelets, anticoagulants, and vitamin K antagonists to determine the optimal regimen. The guidelines at least for now re uh, reflect that in patients with TAVI, they should have lifelong aspirin at a dose of 75 to 100 milligrams daily. In addition, for the initial three months in patients who are at low risk of bleeding, particularly the lower risk, uh, low to intermediate younger population, aspirin plus clopidogrel may be considered, or if there's no indication of vitamin K antagonist uh, with an INR goal of 2.5. What about bicuspid valves? This is uh, from the seminal paper by Dr. Makar and colleagues out of Cedars sinai my former institution, looking at the impact on bicuspid morphology and outcomes. And the idea of stratifying bicuspid morphology depending on the presence of RAFI and the presence of calcium and distribution of calcium, with the idea being that a calcified RAFI with excess lethal calcification poses the greatest risk for a TAVA procedure. And in those patients, perhaps surgical intervention is more appropriate. We see there that this is reflected in clinical guidelines with a significant difference in adverse clinical outcomes as determined by all cause mortality with calcified RAFI plus excess lethal calcification compared to one or the other alone. And so the guidelines have reflected the a higher rate of perivalvular leak in the bicuspid aortic valve population with an associated increase in stroke rate. And given that the younger patients with bicuspid valve, we need to look at the risk benefit ratio of TAVI versus SAVI. And as yet there are no randomized clinical trial with data to show this. And it is likely there will not be randomized data given that at least in the United States, there's approval all the way down to low risk for all the commercial platforms. It's a challenging subset of patients. We need to look at the CT scans to carefully identify the morphologies which may be more suitable for TAVI. Appropriate valve type at size selection is important. We don't yet know the impact of an aortopathy in these populations as they, a lot of them have a dilated ascending aorta. We still don't know what the ideal valve type is for bicuspid anatomy, the role of cerebral embolic protection given the highest stroke risk. And of course, while we all agree that from a data perspective an RCT is needed, it is unlikely that it will occur. Moving on to TAVA in aortic regurgitation, a few important considerations, device sizing, the risk of embolization and migration, residual valve regurgitation and conduction disturbance have all limited the widespread adoption of TAVI in AI. These are two valves I'm about to show you, the Jenner valve and the J valve, very similar valves from different companies that are dedicated devices for aortic regurgitation. They work on this concept of self-expansion where the valve frame finds the cusps of the native annulus to anchor where no calcium is needed as an anchor sitting in place and making it very effective to treat aortic regurgitation. This is the J valve, again, a very similar device to the Yenna valve, which shows you the valve performing inside a frame, which is self anchoring within the sinus. The guidelines reflect that TAVI is rarely feasible and even then only in carefully selected patients who have severe aortic regurgitation with concomitant heart failure, who are deemed to be prohibitive surgical risk and in whom the valvular calcification and or annular size might be appropriate for a transcatheter approach. And as a result, treatment of patients with aortic regurgitation TAVA very much remains in the mainstay of clinical trials with very little being done in the commercial arena. As I said, there are a number of challenges, both patient and anatomy related. There are procedural challenges like the large annular size, the risk of embolization due to lack of calcium, and the residual regurgitation due to difficult placement and identification of the optimal annular level. Newer generation devices have improved this. There's more size variety. A lot of these devices have adaptive seals that have been expanded. They're repositionable in the event that embolization is an option. And then there's mechanisms to grasp the native leaflets. But of course, we await the outcomes from the larger clinical studies before we can move forward. And finally, just to touch on cerebral protection, there is no current guideline on cerebral protection. There is one device approved by the FDA here, the Sentinel-2 vessel capture system. And there is currently a study going on called Protected TAVA, looking at stroke protection with this device during TAVA. And the results of that, I think, are eagerly anticipated to determine whether there will be a place in the guidelines. Very quickly, not so much something in the guidelines, but perhaps something that we should be incorporating in our valve choice selection is the idea of coronary reaccess after TAVA. As we're treating younger, lower risk patients with a lot of comorbidities, a lot of these patients are returning with coronary disease. And so we need to have the ability and the skill set to reaccess the coronaries after TAVA in order to determine how best to treat these patients, particularly in an acute setting. 
This is a paper from Jack Intervention a few years ago out of Mount Sinai, looking at the various guiding catheters that can be used depending on the valve type here with the Medtronic core valve, um, with a number of challenges. There's a lot of concomitant coronary disease. The progression is expanding in these lung, younger patients. The newer and newer devices means that there's a greater breadth of challenge, a different approach to different valves. A lot of these patients are presenting to non-structural centers where interventionalists may not be used to seeing TAVA valves, let alone reaccessing them. It's important to get pre-procedural imaging where possible to help guide the valve selection. And there are need for improvements which we're seeing reflected in device design to optimize future access. With that, I'll stop and take any questions or perhaps we'll hold the questions till the end of the session. Thank you, Rahul. That's very extensive and clear summary of the current guidelines and the evidence for TAVI as well as the, for the role of TAVI in iotic regurgitation. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, we'll have the discussion uh, after the talk by all the speakers. Uh, next uh, speaker, we would uh, I would request our uh, friend and uh, uh, Dr. Darren Mylott from Ireland. Uh, he is one of the uh, cardiologists who took TAVI very early. And uh, Darren Mylott, slide please. Yeah. So he is also an editorial member of the, he's a deputy editor of Euro Intervention. And uh, he's done a lot of work on uh, TAVI. And uh, I have great pleasure. He's in Galway in Ireland. So I have great pleasure in uh, uh, introducing and welcoming Dr. Darren Milet. Can I have uh, Dr. Darren Milet, please? Um, and thank you for asking me to um, uh, deliver this um, uh, uh, discussion on expanding indications for TAVI. My name is Darren Mylott, and I'm an interventional cardiologist in the um, uh, in Galway and uh, the National University of Ireland in Galway in Ireland. Um, so what I thought that I would uh, discuss today is very briefly on, on low-risk aortic stenosis and how that has become an expanded indication mentioned by cuspids patients with asymptomatic aortic stenosis, those with the more complex topic of moderate aortic stenosis, but with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction uh, and pure uh, aortic uh, incompetence, groups that we really have shied away from um, to date with TAVI. Uh, so to begin on the low risk trials, of course, we, we've, we've seen this, uh, uh, these publications in the New England, uh, the Partner 3 study and the core valve low risk trial um, where they randomized low-risk patients um, uh, to either uh, treatment with a, a balloon expandable valve in the case of partner three or the self-expanding valve in the case of the core valve low-risk study uh, to surgery. It is important to know that, that uh, in these studies, patients had to have severe calcific aortic stenosis, a low-risk STS score, which was different in both of these studies, less than 4% in partner three and 3% in the Medtronic trial. And they all have to have transfemoral TAVI. Um, and so these, these trials do not apply to patients who have, for example, um, uh, alternative access whose STS scores are greater than this uh, uh, on the screen. Um, the patients were first adjudicated by a local heart team to be low risk. And then they underwent a second adjudication by a case review committee to ensure that they met the trial criteria. And this was particularly important in patients who had, um, uh, who had, um, uh, treatment in the partner three study because many patients were excluded um, due to LVOT calcium. In fact, about a third of patients who were screened were excluded from the study. There were other important um, uh, low risk uh, criteria that would lead to exclusion. For example, um, uh, if they had iliofemoral dimensions that were not consistent with either uh, uh, either um, um, uh, device, if they had bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, in the case of TAVI, their patients were excluded if they had complex coronary artery disease, if they had significant aortic regurgitation or mitral regurgitation, uh, or were excessively frail. Um, and also, um, from the SAVR point of view, if patients were excessively frail, had carotid stenosis, for example, hostile chest, low FEV ones, these were all patients that were excluded from these studies. So um, the applicability of these studies to the broader TAVI community um, uh, does need to be cautiously adjudicated. 
As I mentioned, case selection was very, very tightly done in, in, in both studies, particularly in the, in the Partner 3 study, where a third of patients failed the screening, um, at less so with the self-expanding technology, where only 8% failed the screening process. We've seen these data, uh, very important data, out to two years, whereby um, uh, uh, TAVI was non-inferior um, to surgical aortic valve replacement. And in fact, with the design of Partner 3, TAVI was superior. Um, but as time goes on, we will see those curves come together as patients start to, um, uh, start to, to be censored. Um, and really, we're unaware of the long-term implications of TAVI compared to SAVR in low-risk patients. So before we really expand to all low risk patients, we certainly need to see, to my mind, longer follow up durations because these younger patients, of course, um, uh, tend to get accelerated valve failure, particularly um, uh, if they have, for example, renal disease, kidney disease and so forth. Um, so we need to see longer term data before we expand this um, information to all patients. By cuspid aortic valve stenosis, of course, as we move into younger patients, we see a much higher um, prevalence of bicuspid aortic valve, and I'm aware that that is the case in India. Um, we saw this when working in China, um, uh, and we initially thought that this was some form of um, genetic um, um, uh, issue, um, but I, I think more recently we believe that it is because the average age of the patient undergoing TAVI in China is younger than the average age of the patient in Europe, and therefore we came across many more bicuspid aortic valves, indeed up to about 40% uh, of cases were bicuspid um, when we were in China treating patients. Um, bicuspid aortic valve morphology uh, poses a number of challenges. Um, I think the most important being the top two there are calcified raphe and dense leaflet calcification, and that calcium is in the body of the leaflet rather than at the leaflet tips or in the sinuses, which is where you see it in tricuspid aortic valve disease. Um, but they can certainly make it more challenging for balloon expandable valve to, um, to open, to anchor and seal, and for, uh, or sorry, for self-expanding valves. And for balloon expandable valves, um, we need to be very cautious in terms of size selection, um, particularly in patients with LVOT calcification or severe calcification. Um, the problem uh, with bicuspid is, is not uh, only the um, uh, choosing the right um, valve type for the patient, but rather choosing the right valve size. In tricuspid aortic stenosis, we're very comfortable with our sizing algorithms um, because we size according to the annulus. But when you see the array of different types of bicuspid anatomy, uh, in this picture, you can see how it would be very difficult to come up with a single sizing algorithm that would meet the needs of all of these bicuspid patients um, that I've treated. Uh, and as such, a case-by-case -case careful analysis is very important to success uh, uh, when treating bicuspid aortic valve disease. And that may not always be the case uh, in tricuspid disease. We do have some historical data um, uh, going back, looking at retrospective uh, analyses um, uh, we published one of the first series, 139 patients treated when we had first generation devices. Only 64% of these patients actually had CT sizing. So telling you that we were very early in our experience. But in that cohort, um, we, we, we did not have wonderful outcomes. We had uh, uh, relatively high gradients. We had mortality of 30 day mortality of 5%. And about 28% of patients had power valve or leak greater than, uh, um, uh, greater than mild. Um, and, and, and so we certainly had some improvements to make. Um, uh, Sung Han Yoon published data with Raj Makar a couple of years later, showing that when we had second generation devices, that in fact, many of those issues went away. Um, uh, but one very important um, issue seems to be stubbornly persistent when we treat bicuspid aortic valve disease, and that is the risk of stroke. Um, we do believe that these valves are more calcified. We do believe that calcium is more friable in patients with bicuspid morphology. Um, and as such, we've seen in, in, in this uh, analysis of the TBT registry, uh, an increase uh, in stroke associated with a bicuspid compared to tricuspid aortic valve disease undergoing TAVI. We're finally starting to see some prospective data. This uh, study, the BioBlueDex study from DDA Teche and Nicola Du, uh, excuse me, uh, Nicola um, um, from, uh, from Rotterdam, uh, the PIs of this study, 150 consecutive patients treated um, uh, by cuspid aortic valve patients treated um, uh, with um, the Evolute uh, Pro or R platforms. Uh, and again, we saw excellent clinical data 
But um, we did, however, see again that that disabling and non-disabling stroke rate is about 4%, uh, which remains troublingly high. Pacemaker uh, 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 implantations uh, are uh, uh, what you would expect um, um, with uh, this device. Uh, However, recent improvements in implant technique should bring that down to single digits. So some work certainly to do uh, with, with bicuspids, particularly in the realm of sizing. With asymptomatic aortic stenosis, well, there are some important caveats here. The first is to say that half of all patients who present with severe aortic stenosis do not actually uh, report symptoms when they, when they are initially diagnosed. So this is a very large cohort of patients. It's also important that if patients truly are asymptomatic, then the risk of cardiovascular death um, or sudden death in the first year is less than 1%. And if we're offering them a treatment that has a mortality, for example, with uh, uh, open heart surgery of approximately 1%, even in low-risk cohorts, uh, we need to be very careful that the, uh, the cure is not worse than the disease. However, once people um, uh, uh, generate symptoms or reduce their EF, their mortality goes up significantly. There are also a cohort of patients who present with very severe aortic stenosis, and this uh, is usually defined uh, as a VMAX greater than five or a mean gradient greater than 60. Uh, and then these patients at two years, they have a six-fold increase of cardiovascular mortality. And so these are the cohort of patients that we should probably be focusing on um, for earlier intervention. Certainly the recovery trial, which is a very small trial, only 145 um, um, asymptomatic patients who were randomized um, in Japan to treatment with surgical aortic valve replacement or a conservative strategy um, uh, uh, leads us to think that there are certain that there are a high high risk group of patients who are asymptomatic who should have earlier intervention. At four years, they found that the early surgery group have a mortality of approximately one percent, and that compares uh, very well to the six percent mortality in those who underwent conservative care. Uh, and that mortality was still one percent at eight years in the early surgery group and going up to 26% in those who had conservative care. So earlier surgical intervention um, was key to improving outcomes in these patients. Uh, I think it's also uh, important to say um, that we need to prove that this is the case with TAVI. However, we would expect that to be the case. If we look at our current uh, AHA-ACC guidelines, it's important to note that because we don't have any evidence in TAVI and we look at this uh, this remaining arm here in patients who have no symptoms, the only indication for TAVI in these guidelines are those who have reduced ejection fraction. All of the others should proceed to surgery. Therefore, we have a great need to generate uh, data with TAVI in this patient cohort. Uh, And the early TAVR study is doing exactly that. Uh, In this study, uh, uh, the uh, uh, investigators are going to randomize uh, 1,100 patients who have had a normal exercise stress test, so they are truly asymptomatic, to a transfemoral TAVI or to clinical surveillance, uh, with the primary endpoint being uh, all-cause mortality, stroke, and repeat cardiovascular hospitalization. Uh, I believe that uh, trial is recruited, and so hopefully we will have some information on that in the next 12 uh, to 18 months. The more complex topic of those with moderate aortic stenosis and heart failure, well, let me give you some statistics and sorry for the busy slide. If you're older than 70, approximately 10% of this cohort uh, in Western uh, populations have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And in those patients, their five-year risk of mortality is very high at 50%. The treatment, of course, is ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, spironolactone, and so forth. And all of these um, are aimed at neurohormonal modulation and most of them at reducing afterload. And so if you consider a patient who has heart failure and moderate aortic stenosis, surely it makes sense that reducing their afterload by treating the valve component of their afterload uh, could potentially reduce um, uh, their mortality. If you have aortic stenosis and reduced um, uh, ejection fraction, about 60% have all-cause death Uh, valve replacement or heart failure hospitalization within four years. So these are a very symptomatic and frail patient population. And thus the question is, if we treated the AS, could we improve outcome? Could we uh, improve that outcome by further reduction in the afterload? Uh, Again, we have a a, a very important trial run by Nicholas van Meegen from Rotterdam again, called the TAVI TAVI Unload trial. This is co-PI'd with Marty Leon. Um, This trial is recruiting slowly, but what it's doing is picking patients who have heart failure with an ejection fraction less than 50%, who are symptomatic despite optimal 
uh, heart failure therapies and who have moderate aortic stenosis. And it's comparing them, it's randomizing them to a treatment strategy of TAVI uh, and optimal heart failure therapies compared to uh, heart failure therapies alone. Patients are then followed up and the uh, uh, primary endpoint is a hierarchical occurrence of death, stroke, hospitalization, and changes in the KCCQ or in their symptomatic uh, status. So hopefully we will have some information in the next couple of years uh, on this study, uh, and uh, which will lead us to, uh, to determine whether in this particular patient population, uh, whether TAVI might be uh, a reasonable strategy. Pure aortic uh, regurgitation, um, uh, th this is um, a, a complex area for TAVI. Um, uh, and indeed, it, it seems to be a complex area for, uh, for, for surgery. Uh, the EuroHeart survey uh, suggested that less than one third of these patients uh, with severe aortic incompetence are actually referred for surgery. And again, that comes down to their comorbidities. The annual mortality in these patients untreated is 10 to 20%. So similar to that for um, uh, for aortic stenosis, and it goes up dramatically once they start to have significant LV dilatation. Uh, early TAVI um, studies in this patient population have been associated with poor outcomes, and that's because of the anatomy that we're putting these devices into. Large left ventricular outflow tracts, large aortic roots, non-calcified leaflets. TAVI are not designed for these particular patient groups in that anchoring and sealing has always been dependent on being able to oversize um, the valve relative to the aortic agonist and having some calcium to grip onto. It's therefore not surprising that when we um, uh, applied first and second generation TAVI devices that we saw reasonable um, uh, outcomes, but still 30-day death rates of 7% and moderate power valve are leaking about 10%. There is, however, um, one valve that has actually been CE marked and is undergoing um, um, uh, an early access FDA study uh, looking for an indication for pure aortic incompetence, and that's the Yena valve. Um, and this device is now delivered through a transfemoral system, um, and it has a unique anchoring mechanism in that rather than using um, uh, uh, radial force uh, and, and oversizing to uh, anchor the device, Rather, it, it, um, it grips onto the, uh, the existing leaflets um, and, and captures them, uh, therefore removing the requirement for that oversizing relative to the individual uh, patient's anatomy. Um, this device has been used very successfully in patients um, with um, pure aortic incompetence, and we look forward to the results of the, uh, of the Align study uh, in, the next, uh, in the next 12 to 18 months. So to summarize, TAVI continues to develop into a mature, safe, and effective technology for patients at all levels uh, of, of, of the risk spectrum uh, with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. Um, it is the, uh, the treatment of choice, as I mentioned, but novel indications are the subject of ongoing uh, prospective randomized trials. Um, expansion to these uh, uh, more nebulous indications will be subject to the results of these studies, and particularly when we think about patients who have a good surgical option. At the moment, these patients should be randomized into, in one of these clinical trials or um, at referred for cardiac surgery. Of course, if these patients then uh, are deemed uh, inoperable, uh, then uh, uh, application of TAVI technology may be reasonable uh, in, uh, in selected patient groups. So thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference uh, and hopefully uh, we can get down uh, uh, back to, uh, uh, to India in the near future uh, to see all of our friends down there. So from us in Galway, ciao. Thank you. And uh, so I think it's a clear uh, indication that TAVI is moving in direct, several directions. I think uh, we are now started doing uh, bicuspid valve is one of the challenging subsets. Uh, now, uh, uh, with also the new trials coming up in TAVI unload trial and early TAVI trial in asymptomatic patients, we are going to move further in treating uh, early uh, patients who have viral stenosis without symptoms. So now uh, with that, uh, let's move on to the next uh, talk. And uh, we have uh, next with Dr. Vinayak Bapat. Uh, he is one of uh, one of the cardiac surgeons uh, who does a large amount of TAVI. So it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Bapat. And he has been uh, uh, very supportive to uh, starting TAVI program in India. And uh, he know he's, uh, many of our uh, cardiologists in India, as well as cardiac surgeons, uh, know Dr. Bapat very well for his uh, skills in both cardiac surgery as well as uh, uh, in TAVI. Uh, so he's currently, uh, uh, he was in, uh, in the London and then moved to the US recently. Uh, he is now uh, in Minneapolis uh, where he's working as a 
assistant professor of surgery. So I, I would like to now uh, invite Dr. Bapath to deliver the talk on uh, iodic valve surgery, minimally invasive iodic valve surgery versus TAVI. Uh, what are the, uh, the best options for treating iodic stenosis at the current time? So Dr. Bapath. Thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation on my thoughts on shared decision-making in low-risk patients with aortic stenosis. As we know very well that transcatheter aortic valve replacement, uh, TAVI or TAVR, uh, has become a level one indication and treatment option for patients with aortic stenosis. And in the United States, it has been approved for low-risk patients over the age of 65. Uh, these are my disclosures. So this presentation, first of all, as you know that I'm a surgeon and I've worked in this space since 2007. This is not about SAVR versus TAVR, but it is to define, you know, age parameters and appropriate use for both the technologies to our patient's advantage. So a few decades ago or years ago, we had only two options. Uh, we were just uh, a patient has aortic stenosis. We either did a BAV or we did aortic valve replacement. And the main debate used to be around mechanical valve versus tissue valve. And as you know, that those guidelines were in Europe, it was 65, in United States, it was age 70. And a lot of it is based on life expectancy. And then came transcatheter aortic valve. And transcatheter aortic valve landscape has had a profound impact on what we do. As you can see, it's a very attractive option for patients. It's less invasive. They can go back to work quickly. And most importantly, if they are high-risk patients, uh, they can survive the procedure. Uh, there are multiple valves which have come in the market, and I may be missing a few. Uh, but at the same time, the evidence has been built as well. Initially, the evidence was built around randomized trials in high-risk patients. Uh, then we, of course, had intermediate and low-risk uh, trials, which have been a landmark in, I think, last uh, 20 years in our uh, heart valve uh, evidence base. And then we have had some brilliant large uh, registries, such as source registry, and now, of course, the post-market TVT registry, which is not perfect, however, gives us an idea of what happens in the real world. This has consistently demonstrated improving results in TAVR and also exposed some flaws and concerns as well. The randomized trial in the low-risk patients, I think we people have not stopped just at that. Uh, there's such as a UK TAVI registry, which is a real-life registry in patients. And of course, we have got Notion trial and other trials which are ongoing. What is very important to understand for all of us is that all these trials have been focusing on two premium devices. What I mean by that is mainly Sapien and Evolutar. And all tavers are not same, such as all surgical valves are not same. So as surgeons have been criticized in the past and present that one valve may be good, but others are not, same applies to taver. And this has been shown very clearly now that many of these taver designs have disappeared. And more importantly, uh, data such as for Sapien XT has clearly shown that just improvement in design doesn't give us good result. You can improve a design with a good intention, but not necessarily good results. And we should not assume as clinicians that next generation device is always going to be better. And this has led to a really good and uh, a very mature heart team discussion. This is informed shared decision making. We have to understand that always patients included in a trial are near perfect patients because there is a, a high class uh, screening committee, uh, center screen patients as well. So this is essentially tricuspid aortic stenosis with evenly distribution calcium and where we see perfect results are going to come. And of course, there are patients who are not enrolled in the trial, such as patients who have got, say, mitral regus, tricuspid regus, bicuspid valve unsuitable anatomy in terms of uh, leak or rupture or coronary obstruction. So I think we need to appreciate when we apply that in our clinical practice. Now, one important piece in the trial which is never addressed is patient's expectation. Patients want only two things. They don't want a second procedure, if possible, 
and they want to avoid anticoagulation. So this is very, very relevant uh, for the further discussion. And let's not forget that. So if we want to do a shared decision for any patient who comes, we want to give them reliable hemodynamics, preferably no anticoagulation, preferably patient takes only risk of one procedure. So if that procedure should last their life expectancy. And if there's a second procedure, do we have an opportunity to optimize the outcome so that it's less invasive and patient takes a risk which is less than it would be? So there are three important components. First important component is life expectancy. We can't say that 65 years is 65 years, and I'm going to discuss that further. The risk and results of the second intervention, we have to understand that, and what's the longevity of the second intervention. And very importantly, we hence have to understand SAVR and TAVR durability. So let's look at life expectancy first. What is definition of young patients? Guideline always says 70 years plus do biological valve. 70 years less do mechanical valve. Similarly, for TAVR, we are saying 65 plus do it, 65 less don't do it. Is that really true? My definition of young and old is simply based on life expectancy and durability of the valve. And what I mean by that? If patient is young, if patient lives longer than the valve, and patient is old, if, you know, is going to be other way around. So I think this is very important. If you look at life expectancy and regional differences, this becomes evident. What applies to me in the United States today necessarily doesn't apply in Japan. In Japan, patients live longer. So we need to define young and old according to patients' life expectancy as well. And maybe in certain Asian countries, this is shorter or certain other countries, it's longer. So I think it's very important that we define that. So the guidelines which are developed in the Western world provide you guidelines, but not necessarily apply in your clinical practice. What about durability? There's a lot of talk on durability. Durability, I always think, is a promise. <clears throat> Every time there's a new technology, a new valve, everybody says it will last 15 to 20 years, 25 years. And there's a lot of confusion about definition of durability. You know, we have had these new definitions saying increase in gradient is durability. And now slowly people are challenging even the concept of gradients. Is this echo gradient correct or we need to use invasive gradient? And eventually we are going full circle back and saying actually patient symptoms are most important. So I think we have to understand the difference between durability definition, patient processes mismatch definition, and really should we just focus on patient symptoms? Uh, effective orifice area of a patient who is active is different than the same effective orifice area for a patient whose needs are minimum uh, when he's, say, 86 or 88 years old. What is the concern of durability? You know, of course, everybody, all the surgeons say tower durability is a concern. Uh, there is a lot of history around it. There's not a single valve which has got a rigid frame. Uh, which has proven long-term durable than a valve, which has got slightly flexible stents. And that's the same reason all the manufacturers of bioprosthetic valve have moved away from rigid stents to non-rigid stents. So at least at this time, TAVR doesn't have that. Secondly, the bovine leaflets which are used are thinner. And the reason being you want to crimp the valve to 12 or 14 French. And that's again one of the reasons that this may uh, perform less longer than the thicker leaflets. And finally, is the asymmetric deployment. As you can see that any design of any valve, except maybe the early porcine valves, worked the best when they were circular and cylindrical. And we know that even the surgical valves, which are implanted and slightly deformed, don't last long. I think the same is going to apply to TAVR, whether we like it or not. So what about SAVR? Saver durability is not without criticism. When we cannot extrapolate you know, durability of one valve onto all the devices, as I mentioned earlier, and this is a great example of Toronto SPV valve, which we were told is going to last forever. And it did till six years, there was absolutely no degeneration. And at seven or eight years, it started failing. So a lot of it can be unknown once we modify a new design. And I think we need to learn from this rather than be overconfident. 
what is the risk and result of the second intervention? Say we do TAVR as a first intervention or a SAVR as a first intervention. If second intervention is needed because patient is younger by my definition, what are we going to offer them? So let's look at if we do a TAVR first in a young patient or a low risk young patient uh, and the TAVR degenerates, what are the options today? So first option would be, of course, TAVR in TAVR because people think, okay, once we have gone through less invasive route, to send a patient for surgery now when he's, he or she is older is not a good idea. And the second thing I would say is explanting TAVR. That's also important because it's like a first time you take valve surgery. So maybe that's the best option for the patient. So let's see what, what data today shows us. And I think we should not assume by some publications, one or two registries thrown to us saying, oh, this is just amazing. And I think we need to debate that heavily before we apply it in our clinical practice. I still think TAVR and TAVR is just a promise, not a reality. So what are the concerns about TAVR and TAVR? There are very few cases done today, and I'm sure that more people are going to do it because patients don't want surgery. A lot of these patients in which it was done are elderly patients, inferior hemodynamics are probably acceptable because if you have slightly less effective orifice area, higher gradient, their demands are not that high. There is definitely risk of coronary obstruction, wall thrombosis. And a lot of these patients, believe it or not, which is not reported in the registry, are on anticoagulation. So let's not forget my first slide. What patients want is they don't want anticoagulation. And that's the whole reason we are doing a tissue valve. And finally, poor hemodynamics. And these are some of the cases we have done, uh, such as you know, Evolutar in Sapien or Evolutar in Evolutar. And all these combinations which we are going to do in future are going to be challenging in terms of determining which is better and which is risky. And this is just to show you some of the publications which are how do, can you use sapien in sapien, evolutar in evolutar, or evolutar in sapien and reverse. And we have done a lot of different combinations. And I must say that it takes a lot of planning and apprehension to do these combinations. So the current data on TAVR and TAVR is also not very promising. Uh, the TAVR and TAVR registry has shown that actually it's not that perfect. If you look at the registry, the median duration of the intervention, that means the duration of intervention where TAVR failed is not very promising. These are patients who had perfect TAVR. And if they didn't last four years or less, how do we expect the second TAVR, which is smaller, is going to last longer? So I think this is where the gradients are higher, leak is common, pacemaker risk is higher, coronary obstruction risk, as I said, is challenging. I think we need to question this strategy and use it selectively till more evidence comes through. And I think, in my opinion, if the first tower didn't last for three or two or four years, how is the second tower going to last anyway for longer duration? So I think this patient is destined or third or fourth intervention, which is going to be worse for the patient as well. But on the other hand, currently the transcatheter valve explant is, is not easy as well. And there is an interaction between ascending aorta, left ventricle outflow tract, there's a mitral proximity, conduction tissue damage, and I've seen it all. And I think what we have done for the last four years is trying to educate the surgeons who necessarily are not involved with TAVR and understanding how to explant TAVR carefully so as to reduce the risk of complications. And I think this is very important. If you look at the explant registry, you can see that the mortality is pretty high. And these patients were necessarily those high-risk and intermediate high-risk patients who underwent TAVR explant. And a lot of these patients were infected with endocarditis. So I think it's understandable that the risk is, say, 11 to 20%. However, I think we need to lower it down for elective replacement. This is just to highlight the technique we use for Evolutar. And a lot of people think Evolutar explantation or tall wall explantation means ascending aorta and root replacement. Uh, this is actually not true. Uh, this is my chief resident explanting Evolutar, which has been there for three years. Uh, this is a slightly fast forward video, but you can see that we are, going, we are using a spatula, which we use for endarterectomy to slowly and patiently remove the valve from the ascending aorta. 
And this is very important. If you rush through, you're going to damage the aorta, which will make you know the whole situation long. The beauty of Evolutar is you can compress the device. This is a 19 all based device. So as you can see, you free it up carefully. You can actually peel it off nicely. <clears throat> then what he's doing is he's peeling it off inwards. Uh, as you can see here uh, from the aortic valve. And this is another important step. I have seen people trying to pull it out and dissect it outwards, and that leads to damage to mitral valve and conduction tissue. So my advice always is push the device inside the lumen. It's a very compressible device. And then once you push it inside nicely, <clears throat> you can remove it. You can remove the aortic valve leaflets and then do a AVR as you do it first time. And I think this is very, very important. Um, as you can see that if you do a SAVR in these patients, uh, the options are valve in valve reoperation. And there is some midterm, very good midterm data and long-term data available on this topic. Uh, so I think both these things are reality at present. And coming to valve in valve, uh, we know that this valve in valve uh, performs very well. This is actually one of my patients in London in 2010. Uh, so we have been doing this for more 11 or 12 years now. And this is less traumatic procedure. And we have got new generation surgical valves now, which have got a expandable base to avoid the Russian doll effect. And I think these designs are critical in future. And I'm sure more of such designs are going to be available in future for all of us to use, not just to optimize the initial performance, but to optimize the wall in wall performance in future. So let's take a real life situation now. And I think this is the part of the discussion and I'm sure we don't know the answer correctly. Let's take a patient who is 60 to 65, has a good anatomy, low risk patient. And our goal is procedure which is low risk, good recovery, long-term benefit, no anticoagulation, and preferably avoid second intervention, or if it is so, it is less invasive. I would say that this patient is definitely going to offer a biological wall today. So I think the discussion focuses on TAVR and SAVR. So I think our aim should be a bioprosthesis with good size and good durability. Life expectancy of this patient is say 15 to 20 years. And I think this is very important. So for the sake of discussion, I'm going to compare the largest selling SAVR and largest selling TAVR in the world at present. Uh, so that any bias is removed from the conversation. So uh, currently the one valve which is largest uh, implanted is uh, Inspiris, which is based on Perimount and then Magna Magna is designed. Uh, this has got experience of at least four to five decades to my knowledge, minimum design change. I would say uh, the change has been focused on durability. That means the design change is mainly focused on durability. So as we know that now we have got a Resilia component, which promises to be better than Thermafix. And then the frame is optimized for the second procedure. So we have got Resilia and we have got in partner three trial, it was shown very clearly that most of the surgical patients had a larger EOA and valve size than the TAV. Tower design, we are going to, sake of uh, convenience, we're going to take Sapien 3, which is the largest selling tower device. It has undergone multiple changes in the last 10 years. And the design changes have been focused on only one thing, a small cream profile. And it's a rigid frame, uh, more leaflet strain maybe, and we know that circularity, et cetera, is beyond our control at least. Uh, use of CT is very important today. And I am taking this opportunity to impress on the surgeons who are in the audience and in the panel to say that planning surgery, uh, CT scan and uh, using CT scan for planning is important. I use it regularly for sizing the surgical valve as well, so that if I know that there's a chance of PPM, I plan it differently before I open the chest. I also can anticipate things such as calcification, bicuspids, etc. Approach in this patient in my center would be less invasive approach. Uh, patient will stay for five or you know maybe six days and is back to work in four weeks. Uh, if we are doing a tower, patient will have a transfemoral tower for sure. He will be one or two days in the hospital and he is back to work in seven days. So the difference is basically recovery. 
Now, what is the lifetime management of this patient and cumulative risk? And this is where the debate comes. This patient is going to, you know, most likely outlive the valves. So let's say, Saver, if we believe the durability of 15 years or 12 years or 20 years, the second intervention may not be needed at all. But if it is needed, we can definitely do a wall in wall. And we understand that in this patient, the wall in wall option because of expansion is better. There's a less chance of anticoagulation. If we do TAVR in this patient and say this lasts for 10 years, this patient will be 100% going to need a second intervention. The early TAVR in TAVR data is not that promising and the need for anticoagulation is higher. If you send him to us for explantation, currently the risk of explant is much higher than before. So most likely, if we do a TAVR in this patient with the current evidence available and understanding, I think there's a high chance of two or three interventions. And we are adding every time another layer of risk, which we don't understand. So I think if you take cumulative risk in this patient, there's a chance that either way, whether he has TAVR, TAVR in TAVR and then surgery, or TAVR and TAVR explant, the cumulative risk is much higher. And I think it's not a really good trade-off at age of 60, 65 for three weeks of recovery time. <clears throat> if we do SAVR in this patient, I think currently the chance is that he may not need a second intervention. And if he needs a second intervention, we can still do a wall in wall which we have reasonable competency, understanding, and good midterm data. So I think the cumulative risk of this patient is much less. I also appeal to all surgeons that when they do a SAVR today, they understand that how it may impact, especially in young patients, when they come for wall in wall. For example, if I'm doing a SAVR in bicuspid, I make sure that the coronaries are not near the stent post so that it's hard sometimes in bicuspid but orientation of the device, et cetera, I pay more attention than before. So I think this patient, in my opinion, today is probably served better by SAVR. So I think to summarize my final thoughts, life expectancy and war durability should be combined to make a decision. The current evidence for sure points that SAVR is the best option in terms of lifetime management. And I think this bar should change if we get additional evidence to support otherwise. And I think we should be flexible enough to add up to that evidence so that we give our patients the best option, not only the first time, but also the second time. Thank you. And lastly, I would uh, thank the opportunity to share my thoughts over this. Uh, I'm going to try and join live, but if I cannot because of time differences and travel, I wish you all a very good meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bapat. I think Dr. Bapat is uh, traveling on flight and uh, hopefully he should be able to join us for discussion. So I think uh, it, is a, it is an interesting talk on choosing the best therapy for the patient. I think you have to consider uh, patient's uh, uh, condition, age, which is very important, and the longevity uh, to make a good decision on uh, TAVI versus uh, surgery. Uh, so I think uh, with this, I think we let's move to the uh, next topic. And uh, this is going to be uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Daljit Kaur and Dr. Narsimhan. Uh, Dr. Daljit Sagu is an electrophysiologist uh, uh, based in Hyderabad, AG Hospital Hyderabad. She's done a lot of work in, uh, uh, in uh, electrophysiology, particularly they've done some studies in uh, post-TAVI conduction disturbances uh, and has been uh, uh, published uh, numerous papers uh, in uh, several journals. So I, would, I, and I, I, I think all of us know about Dr. Narsimhan. He's a very eminent uh, electrophysiologist in the country based in Hyderabad. Uh, so I request to Dr. Daljit and Dr. Narsimhan team to deliver this talk. Over to Dr. Daljit Sagu, please. Uh, Daljit, go ahead, please. Thank you for having me here for delivering this talk on conduction system abnormalities post time. So... So I thought I'll start my talk with this. This is a typical uh, uh, fluoro image seen when we do EP study in the lab. So when this is a typical catheter we put. This is a his catheter. This is a coronary sinus catheter. This is a HRA catheter. HRA is high right atrium catheter. And if you walk, if you see the autogram, this is the non-coronary cusp. Daljit, can you use a pointer, please? Yeah, this is a non-coronary cusp, and just below the non-coronary cusp. 
you have a his recording if you can see this is a classical his recording seen here and this catheter is into the non coronary cusp and the his is just below this and the distance between both is less than 1 cm if you see this is is not it is not surprising to know that if the implantation depth of the device is more than 5 to 7 mm below the aortic annulus there is a consistently high risk of new onset left bundle branch block so why we are discussing this topic because heart blocks post over is not uncommon and depending upon the various study the incidence ranges from 4.3 to 43% depending upon the type of valves used and the site of block whenever it is happening it is higher grade that is intrahesian or infrahesian it's not at the node level and delayed high grade av block which happens after discharging the patient from the hospital that is after 48 hours sometimes they are missed and they can be the reason of sudden cardiac death in the post op patients so i would like to discuss little anatomy about this area when, uh, when we are discussing about the conduction abnormality this is on left side of the septum if you can see and this slide shows the membranous septum which is at the junction of the non coronary cusp and the right coronary cusp you can see this is a membranous septum and this is the muscular septum and this is the area from the inferior border of which there is a penetrating bundle of the his which crosses from right side comes towards the left hand side which lies at the inferior aspect if you can see this is the penetrating bundle of the his this is the membranous septum this is the tricuspid annulus so your main bundle that is the penetrating bundle lies lies at the inferior aspect of the membranous septum that's why it's very important to know in when you are doing imaging and the measurements it's very important to know what is the depth of this membranous septum because if it is membranous septum is impinged you are sitting on this you are doing the compression of this uh, penetrating bundle of this causing intrahesian or the infrahesian blocks so this is very important no no and if you see the right bundle is a thin structure it's a cord like thin structure it is very easy to injure especially when we do ep study we can injure it very easily and it recovers very easily whereas if you go on the left side of the septum if you can see this is a membranous septum if you go on the left side of the septum left bundle lies just below the membranous septum and it is devising into the thin anterior fascicle and thicker posterior fascicle and it lies just below the membranous septum so if that's that's the reason the commonest new conduction defect which is seen after the valve replacement is the new onset left bundle branch block the parameters they depend not only on the, the anatomy varies in each patient it may not be same so penetrating bundle of this may be long or the short the membranous septum may be big or the short usually the division of the that is branching bundle of the his divides at the crux of the muscular septum this is the left bundle and the right bundle comes here in few patients this his bundle the division happens deep within the muscular septum in some patients if the division is happening deep within the muscular septum then the chances of block will be less so thanks to the conduction system pacing because we have gone back to the details of the anatomy of the conduction system and you can see this is an unpass view of the aortic valve and if you see at the junction of the non coronary cusp and the right coronary cusp your branching your bundle of this is sitting just beneath this and if you are if you are having a pressure effect on this the patient can have different types of the conduction blocks another parameter to understand this is right ventricular outflow tract is much wider as compared to the lvot left ventricular outflow tract as it goes upwards it becomes much more narrower so smaller size narrower left ventricular outflow tract is also a uh, indication that the patient may have a high chances of block if you can see this is the area of the membranous septum and this is the area this is a left bundle and usually a valve comes here and sits here and it sometimes impinges on the membranous septum what are the other factors apart from the anatomical factors i'm talking about are the procedural characteristics which involves this what is the level of the valve positioning as i already told that in the relation to the aortic annulus whether we are performing mean pre dilation there are few studies which showed that pre dilation itself causes in 50% of the cases it itself causes conduction block although it may revert what is the size of the prosthetic valve bigger the size of the prosthetic valve the more is the chances of the conduction block what is the type of the valve so self expanding valves 
are much more the chances of the conduction block is much more with the self expanding well as compared to the balloon wells the, uh, the literature says and the pre existing native well condition because we know these are older patients along with the aortic stenosis they have lot of calcifications and the calcifications can extend into the non cornicus below the non cornicus and that is one of the parameters we calculate the calcium volume pre procedure to see that the chances of the blocks will be much more if the calcium is much more and going into the conduction system what is the mechanism commonest reason is a mechanical compression on the hyperkinesis system others are perivalvular inflammatory responses edema ischemia these are the reasons in which patient develop block on the delayed block like like after 48 hours or after 15 days after discharging the patient from the hospital so that's why when we do pre tower assessment actually there is no proper guidelines like there is no guidelines which says that pre tower you should assess for the conduction disturbances meticulously apart from the imaging which we do there is one problem that the these patients are itself at higher risk, uh, risk of conduction blocks and the symptoms of the bready arrhythmias overlaps with the symptoms of severe as we all know that the fatigue light headedness and syncope which can happen with the severe as are the symptoms which happens with the bready arrhythmia so there is no consensus to perform the routine ambulatory monitoring before the tower to see the higher degree of av block but if we have a baseline ecg for some reason if we have a halter available we should go through it meticulously so that we can tell the patient what is the chances or to some extent what is the chances the patient may need pacemaker for after the procedure and the other parameters as i already discussed is imaging characteristics and what is the device we are choosing with the background of the patient characteristics we can to some extent predict that the patient can have heart block ecg parameters when we talk about ecg parameters baseline right bundle branch block is the highest more con most consistent strongest predictor of post procedure av block why that happens if you see that if there is already a right bundle branch block and we know that the chances of conduction block is on the left side that is the branching or the penetrating bundle of the his and new onset lbbb is very high so already if there is an rbbb a little injury to the his intrahisian region or intrahisian region there is a very high chance of patient developing the av block so if there is a complete rbbb at the baseline there is a very high chance the patient may need pacemaker so we should be very meticulous when we are doing imaging when we are seeing other parameters and during the procedure and if there is an underlying rbb even if there is no new changes in the ecg it is always better to retain transvenous pacing for uh, 24 hours before we discharge the patient other parameters baseline ecg patient may already be having chronotropic incompetence six sinus syndrome which is not related to your procedure per se baseline other kind of bundle branch block that is left anterior hemi block left bundle branch block or pr prolongation all these should seen before the procedure we should do measurements and keep it because intra procedure or post procedure changes then we can compare it with the pre procedure ecg presence of isolated first degree av block without any bundle branch block narrow qrs is not an independent predictor for the av block what are the markers during the procedure when you are doing the procedure when you are doing continuous monitoring new onset left bundle branch block we know that it can develop in up, up to 25% of the cases so this is the commonest abnormality we are predicting and we should be observing for the width of the qrs new onset lbbb with or without increase in the pr interval or qrs duration from baseline to more than 20 millisecond development of transient block when we are doing dilation or when we are inflating or when we are placing the valve we should be observing whether it's transient or persistent and most important is patient is having underlying block but patient has along with that a little pr prolongation which is more than 20 millisecond so these are the patients if there is a pr prolongation in the patient who is having underlying bundle branch block this pr prolongation is not related to av node this pr prolongation is related to further slowing into the another bundle so this denotes the intrahesian or infrahesian blocks so pr prolongation with the underlying bundle branch block is a very important predictor because there is a very high chance in these patient that they will develop high grade av block and the pacemaker should be considered in these patients there is a clear cut thing that you should not be confused and we should consider permanent pacemaker or if there is a prior rbbp and during procedure there is a clear high grade av block to is to one or complete av block 
even if it is transient, we should err on the side of putting the pacemaker. If there is a prior bundle branch block right or left with the new onset PR prolongation, which is more than 20 milliseconds, with further widening, with or without further widening of QRS, that is more than 20 milliseconds, or absolute PR interval of more than 240, an absolute QRS more than 150, we should err on side of putting the pacemaker. Or when you are doing the procedure and there are recurrent higher grade AV blocks, uh, they, are, they are reverting and then again happening and there is a recurrent higher grade AV block by the time you are coming out, you should err on considering putting the pacemaker before the discharge. It's not uncommon to see atrial fibrillation in these patients because they are older patients, they may have LV dysfunction, they are having severe AS itself is a mark, is the chances the patient can have atrial fibrillation. If there is an AFib and the patient has developed slowing of the ventricular rate of less than 100 beats per minute with new or old left bundle branch block, or, or new or old left bundle branch block should be considered for the pacemaker. Once we have decided the pacemaker, I thought I should touch on what is the type of the pacemaker because this is newer thing that is conduction system pacing can be considered conduction system pacing in the post hour. There is already a data on both this bundle and left bundle branch area pacing in the patient in the post hour. But the success rate for the his bundle pacing is less as compared to the left bundle pacing. And the success rate is less with the core valve because the core valve goes sits deep within the annulus and the his bundle lies at that site only. The success rate for his bundle is less as for the core valve as compared to the sapien valve. Otherwise also success rate for his bundle pacing is less. That's why overall uh, we have moved to the left bundle branch area pacing. Why we are thinking of the conduction system pacing in these patients? Because the tower patient, there are significant number of patients, they have LV dysfunction. And we all know about the RV pacing in such cases can increase the dyssynchrony. And there is already a data saying that post pacemaker patients, they have more heart failure hospitalization, they have reduced LVEF improvement and compared to the patients who are not having a pacemaker and the less improvement in the LVEF in these patients post pacemaker as compared to the patients who are not having pacemaker. So because conduction system pacing can take care of all these things, they, they can preserve the LV synchrony, they're associated with reduction in the heart failure hospitalization, and they can reduce the pacing-induced cardiomyopathy can be considered in the patient with beta tower. And the chances of LV dysfunction in future is less. So plus it is because we know that the posterior inferior edge, lower edge of the tower, it sits, sits on the above the membrane septum. We know the level below this, you have a his. So we can use this as a marker for mapping the conduction system, his bundle and the right bundle and the left bundle in these patients. I would like to share a case of 75 year old male, severe AS. He had underlying left bundle branch block and you can see there was little PR prolongation, PR of 200 millisecond. And post our second day, this patient developed very long PR interval. If you can see now, the PR interval has drastically increased to 270 milliseconds. So we waited for 48 hours. And after this, this patient was taken up for conduction system pacing. And I would like to just show that this is a temporary, we first mapped the, his bundle and then we have pushed the, uh, his bundle catheter towards the apex so that in the emergency, we can use it for temporary pacing. And this, this is, you can see that this is a septum mark and we are putting the lead inside. This is while we are screwing the lead deep within the septum. And this is after screwing the lead into the septum. And this is when you do pacing, this patient, we, we could achieve the non-selective his pacing. If you can see, we can get a QRS narrowing when we are pacing from the uh, his conduction system pacing lead, then the baseline QRS. But I would say because this was a pacing into the distal his bundle. We have put uh, this case, especially I put a CRTP, I put a backup lead because I was really not sure in the future how this lead will be. So a one backup RV lead was placed in this patient and we have given CRTP in this patient. This is the ACC consensus guideline of 2020 showing how to intra procedure when the patient is having how to manage the conduction block. If you can go through this, this is a very busy thing. If you can go through this, many things are unexplained. Everywhere they have written that ultimately it's the discretion of the implantation team. Ultimately it's the discretion of the implantation. So there is no clear cut guideline if there are new blocks apart from the set criteria which I told. If there is a new blocks, what we should do next? 
for how long we should monitor, whether we should leave temporary pacemaker for long. So there is no clear cut guidelines. There is, there is no randomized trials done on this. So this is post hour, and if you say, see this outpatient monitoring, they have said that, but duration of the, in the patient who's developing new onset arrhythmia, for example, atrial fibrillation, or there's a progression of baseline conduction disturbances, but they have not mentioned which kind of conduction disturbances. And if they feel they have written, it's on the physician's discussion, if they feel they can give extended monitoring for 14 days. EP study, there is, it is not there clear cut in the guidelines, but the few studies they have done, electrophysiology study to see that if the uh, block is higher grade or the lower grade or to decide whether the pacemaker should be given. But if we do EP study, if the absolute HD interval is more than 100 millisecond, we should consider pacemaker in the patients. If with the underlying bundle branch block, new or underlying bundle branch block, if the his two ventricle interval is more than 75 milliseconds, we should consider pacemaker. And if baseline HV was measured before implanting the device, HV was measured and there's an absolute increase in the value of HV of more than 30 milliseconds, a device should be considered. And there's one study in which they have done that A pacing, that is we do in the electrophysiology laboratory, we can do A pacing at a rate of 120 to 150 beats per minute. At a, not, this is not very fast rate. And at a slower pacing, that A pacing at a rate of less than 150, if we demonstrate high grade AV block, more than Mobitz type 2 AV block, we should consider pacemaker. So in these all these cases, we should be giving a pacemaker not only giving the pacemaker, it is prudent that once pacemaker is implanted, a meticulous follow-up in the device clinic should be done to see what is the percentage of pacing in these patients because there is a chance the, uh, the block may improve over the time. There are studies which have shown, even in the VSD cases we have seen, when we do VSD device closures, we see that over three to six months, if it is related to inflammation or something, the blocks may improve. The requirement, of the requirement of the pacemaker may come down. So it is always important not only giving the pacemaker, but following them and seeing whether the need of the pacemaker has increased or decreased, which will be helpful for the future, completing properly giving the guidelines in whom, in which patients we should be considering the device. Last, but not the least, there is a need of, there's a paucity of the data for certain things. Transient high-grade AV block with the pre-existing left bundle branch block. How and for how long we should monitor? Because there's one study in which they have monitored with ILR for one year, which will increase the cost. If there is a new onset bundle branch block, or there's a new onset non-specific intraventricular conduction delay, for how long we should monitor and which device we should use ELR, we should use ILR, or commonly, commonly for 14 days or one month monitoring is used, but should be extended whether to consider A pacing in these patients before implant and during and post implant is a question. And whether to give, there is no study which shows that detection of new arrhythmia which can happen during the follow-up period of one. I'll stop here and I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Daljit. That was an extensive presentation of the complete overview of the conduction disturbances post avi And uh, we will have the discussion uh, after the next talk, uh, and uh, and just uh, I know that we now with the uh, implantation of TAVI devices uh, in a, as high as possible, particularly uh, with the new uh, cusp overlap, you self-expanding valves and also balloon expandal valves have very low incidence of uh, conduction disturbance post TAVI. The incidence are low, about five to seven percent of them uh, require. Uh, uh, um, pacemakers and that too with the physiological pacing as you just described, I think uh, the outcome would be good. So let's discuss this uh, after the last talk. The next uh, talk would be an uh, interactive discussion. And uh, for this discussion, I, I would wel welcome uh, Dr. Narsingen. Uh, I, I think we're all aware of Dr. Narsingen as a, a national president of Indian Society of Hypertension and also uh, a board member of the World Hypertension League. He's a vice chairman of the Lipid Association of India. And he's been uh, very active in uh, API Chennai chapter. Uh, and uh, uh, he's uh, been actively involved in, uh, in uh, lipid uh, lowering therapies. And, uh, and we will have a discussion on uh, management of patients post-TAVI. Now that we are having several patients being treated with the TAVI therapy, we need to understand how to uh, treat these patients, how to follow up these patients. And also we have with us uh, uh, Dr. Priya Chokalingam, uh, who is... Uh, 
uh, who is the uh, who is the runs a center for cardiac rehabilitation in chennai and who will be a part of this uh, discussion uh, thank you uh, over to dr narsinghan to take this forward uh, thank you very much uh, dr sangutwil uh, for uh, giving me an opportunity in tabi simplified scientific session i think we heard from the surgeons we heard from the cardiologists the usefulness of uh, the new procedure tabar and uh, of course we are now entering into tabar in tabar and the surgical procedures which have been highlighted by dr vinayak i think it is uh, my personal question before we take up the discussion when you have a sever as well as a tab and you have been doing a lot of procedures with tab and do you think that we can probably apply what we have learned from the surgical wells dr sengutwil can you just give me some hint about it yeah so basically uh, the surgeons when they started i think we have eminent surgeons in the panel so we, we can also hear from them uh, so uh, as we know that uh, the surgeons uh, initially started uh, with the you know, the mechanical valves and now that uh, with the with to avoid one, anticoagulation now we're moving more towards uh, tissue valves and uh, uh, compared to the tissue valves now we also use the tava valves or basically same tissue valves i think we heard from dr bapat stock on how to choose uh, tavi versus uh, surgical tissue valve i think more and more now now they using only tissue valve surgeons are using only the tissue valves for most patients so to decide as the tavi or savi we to take into account uh, mainly the age and comorbidities and and then decide which would be the best options and i think uh, uh the the the, 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 the people who really want tavi i think if you want more number of procedures happen over a period of the life expectancy is long then as we as we heard from dr bapat stock uh, start with the tavi and then do a, a exp explantation of the valve with the with the surgery and then uh, a third valve the tavi can be done uh, we know that uh, the, the tavi valves last for about 10 to 15 years so in such situations we need to think of all this when we discuss uh, the options with the patient um and what is your experience with the tavi and tavi yeah so uh, again uh, as was point tavi and tavi again have very very uh, very small number of patients have undergo these procedures uh, and also uh, we know that uh, there are more risks associated with compared to second time tavi increases the risk of uh, coronary obstruction increases the risk of valve thrombosis so of course it can be done but it needs a lot of planning and uh, sometimes we we do uh, in when we do a procedure of tavi procedure if we land up with a severe valve leak we sometimes put a second valve in so uh, basically most of the patients do well but with a tavi valve fails and you put a second valve in there are more challenges and we need to appropriately can i request others to mute the mind please so it's more challenging it needs a proper planning assessment to when we do a second tavi in in a, in a for a failed tavi i think uh, dr can i just request dr akshay to give a comment on surgical valves and the current scenario of our approach in managing people with the severe aortic stenosis dr uh, akshay yeah thank you very much for the opportunity thank you sengutoil for uh, inviting me to this elite panel on a very interesting hot topic which is going on now uh, see we have been uh, hearing i mean i last uh, almost 15 years i've been attending the all these meetings where tavi was initially started so much of things have happened but now the the, the technology has come to india and it is being uh, done on a regular basis so one of the things which i want to mention in this context is you know, as like in many other fields there is no comparative data because we have not have any solid data from our country as to the applicability the criteria by which we go the body surface of the patient the, the annular size of the patient so many factors are important when you consider implanting this valve we have not had we are all quoting the data from the western countries rightly or wrongly very few data is coming up from our country plus the problem of uh, uh, redoing this tavi that also has to be considered very well because it's not an easy thing because having done uh, many a lot of complex aortic surgeries i think it will be a phenomenal task to uh, explain a, a tavi we may end up in uh, removing the aortic root repairing doing bypass so many problems depending upon a given case and i don't think many surgeons will be competent enough to do this complex problems as of today 
I can tell you that because you need a lot of expertise in removing this and putting that. So one of the things we have to be careful is to advocate this procedure in the right age of the patient. What is uh, the durability of the valve and the uh, and the age of the patient in terms of any given rather than making generalized criteria in our country. We have to really select the patient's, uh, uh, the, the, the size of the patient, the, age, the body surface area, the age, the physical activity the patient can do, the financial considerations. Uh, because uh, in, in my experience, even an 80-year-old person, we can do an aortic valve replacement surgically today in India with a mortality close to zero. So as we know that with the, it, it is very safe to do an open surgical procedure which lasts long. But this technology has really helped because in even our experience, uh, personal experience also, a lot of uh, patients who have had this procedure are doing very well. So my advice to all of you who are popularizing, popularizing this procedure is to have some criteria so that everybody will not be doing you know, this procedure in all the patients, finally creating a confusion. Same happens in endovascular procedures in aortic, uh, aortic surgery. Because, you know, there are specific indications for doing endovascular intervention and surgical procedures. If a procedure is done in a wrong patient, that will be the beginning of a problem. So that is one thing I have to tell that uh, as the, as per, I'm sure it is going to pick up in a very big way. And uh, like uh, Vinayak also has mentioned about the durability of the valve concentration and on the size and the safety of uh, uh, doing this in a smaller, uh, you know, aortic, I mean, femoral arteries where you, you make the, 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 the components smaller so that it can be used widely. So when it can be used widely, more people will be doing in cases in younger patients, which I think should not should resist at present in our country until technology is developed. That's what I can tell. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bashi. I think I should go back to Dr. Sengu to it. Bashi, Bashi, one, one, more, one more question, Bashi. In yeah. your experience of valve uh, uh, replacement, what is the do uh, longevity of the patient? You know, in your uh, experience after your uh, valve replacement. Valve the... replacement. I have uh, nearly more than uh, five hundred patients with the tissue valve replacement. Uh, okay, tissue. Are you are asking me about a tissue yes. valve or mechanical valve. Tissue valve. Tissue valve. Tissue valve. Yeah, tissue valve. Tissue valve. Yeah. See the and also I get a lot of cases for reoperation from uh, operations done from other centers. The average longevity of an aortic valve in tissue aortic valve, which I have seen is 12 years, 10 to 12 years. Degenerated valves have come even as early as seven years have explanted valves. The longest I have seen but in my own patient is about 14 years. No, no patient more than 14 years there in my follow-up of tissue valves. Within 14 years, they require understanding. Sengo Tuvel, in, in, in the world experience, Tavi, uh, what is the longest experience? So I think maybe we can ask Rahul. I think uh, in our experience, we have seen that uh, the the valve, uh, the tissue valves also, the TAVI valves also last, also similar to what Dr. Bashi was telling about 10 to 12 years. Uh, but uh, we have uh, been starting doing TAVI only in the last uh, about uh, about six, six, seven years. So we've been having uh, good results for the last six, seven years. Maybe uh, Rahul, can you tell us uh, on the longest yes, yeah. follow-up you've had uh, in these TAVI patients? Yeah, sure. So I think as, as has been echoed, the data is uh, we have for equivalence uh, after 10 years. But, you know, we started TAVI at least in the partner study in 2008. And so that at least from, from the study perspective is the longest running patients. And there's honestly very few patients who are uh, kind of alive from that, that 2008 year because you recall the first cohort was that high uh, extreme risk. Um, and so there are some patients who've had a TAVR at 10 years and beyond, but the, the numbers of those patients who are actually alive now are very few, not related to longevity, but just simply the age at which they received their valve in the first place. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's good to be uh, yeah, Regarding the anti, uh, anti thrombotic uh, therapy, will you please tell us uh, where will you use a single antiplatelet drug? Where will you use a dual antiplatelet drug? What is the current recommendation from the ACCAH, European Society? So these TAVI populations are generally very elderly and uh, they very often have LV dysfunction. They have atrial fibrillation. They are more prone to a higher risk of thromboembolism. So basically they're at higher risk of uh, thrombosis. Also because of their age, uh, they're also at higher risk for bleeding. So we have a population where, where, who have both uh, high risk for uh, thrombosis as well as bleeding. 
and uh, to today with the, now we have some data there are a few trials now with that uh, even with the guidelines now uh, what the recommendation says is for most of the patients who do not have af atrial fibrillation who do not uh, ha have an indication for anticoagulation the only antiplatelet therapy is recommended uh, that would be for uh, uh, initially uh, we we were do duapt that is dual antiplatelet with aspirin and clopidogrel for the initial 6 months followed by aspirin lifelong that is was that is what is the recommendation generally for all the tavi patients who, who are not in atrial fibrillation but now we have many new trials like uh, recently we have a popular trial which has said that uh, using aspirin alone uh, in fact is even good uh, in fact is more than enough than using a dual, dual antiplatelet agent so in those patients who have high bleeding risk we will uh, try uh, a single antiplatelet drug with aspirin post tavi whereas in situations where the patients are in atrial fibrillation or there is a need for anticoagulation then those patients uh, would be uh, given anticoagulation with a single antiplatelet drug and uh, for some for, for first three months and then continued on only anticoagulation so again it is going to be more of a tailor making uh, depending on the patient's uh, need and the risk but it's very clear that routine anticoagulation is not necessary for all tavi patients Rahul, your Rahul guidelines. Sharma. Rahul Sharma, you, your guidelines. You are mentioning about the anticoagulants and the INR to be maintained at two point five or something like that. Rahul, you said about the guidelines. Yes. Correct. So, the, so the guidelines. The aspirin monotherapy is for all, and that's the current practice in our institution. And for those who are at low bleeding risk, as Dr. Sengatov we alluded to, aspirin plus clopidogrel or a anti uh, vitamin K antagonist with an INR of two point five. but as he said that that's only for patients in low bleeding risk and we maintain that for patients who have another indication for an anticoagulant such as concomitant atrial fibrillation uh, dr hirmat uh, uh, you know in your experience now you have listened to both the surgeons and uh, uh, cardiologists opinion suppose if a case comes whom you will send it for tavi whom you send it for valve replacement to the surgeon being a surgeon what is your criteria to select and then send the patients Uh, even if the current guidelines define any age group, as Dr. Bapat and Dr. Basi mentioned clearly, we have to go case to case basis only. That's what we would recommend. And uh, case to case basis, uh, we take a call, and especially uh, the class one indication, the elderly patients, we do go ahead with the TAVI because the current uh, technology definitely uh, we would prefer that. In younger patients, uh, still we do have option of uh, TAVI. uh going in and uh, explaining the patients the risk involved uh, including the heart block per se and the advantage is subsequently reintervention and valve in valve procedure also becomes an uh, non invasive procedure that's always there but uh, surgically we do have uh, much safer procedures and even including uh, valve replacement or even if it's assisted root enlargement procedure also can be attended to and even based on the body surface areas that can be taken care Over to Narsingh. Narsingh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Doctor Secretary, uh, can you tell us about uh, the role of uh, uh, apixaban in your clinical practice? Which patients probably may require apixaban therapy as per the current recommendation based on the randomized controlled trials? Okay. So, uh, as you know, apixaban uh, is a is a uh, in the Atlantis uh, trial. No, in the Atlantis uh, trial. Yeah, the Novak. Uh, which is now as i said routine anticoagulation is uh, not uh, with apixaban is not needed for those patients who are not in atrial fibrillation but again i think uh, we'll talk about the atlantis trial maybe i'll have a slide to show it to you i'll just share my slide uh, one can you see my slide okay yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah so this is the atlantis trial uh, which was again for apixaban in patients who had a successful tavi procedure so there were two arms one was those patients who needed anticoagulation so that was compared with the vitamin k antagonist versus uh, apixaban and the other arm was uh, a routine dapt that is antiplatelet agent versus apixaban and uh, the trial did show that apixaban Uh, is clearly not superior to standard antiplatelet therapy so it was uh, it was shown that uh, routinely using apixaban uh, was in fact the increased risk of bleeding compared to antiplatelet therapy 
and uh, however uh, in uh, in patients who had uh, uh, vitamin uh, who needed anticoagulation uh, again uh, there was no there is no superiority of uh, of uh, pixiban so for those patients who have, who needed anticoagulation maybe epic scan can be a substitute but uh, compared to antiplatelet therapy definitely uh, there was no any benefit of using apixaban routinely post ab what did you learn from uh, galileo trial where they used rivaroxaban okay again again the similar trial uh, was a uh, galileo trial uh, instead of apixaban it was rivaroxaban again uh, this trial actually compared the rivaroxaban and aspirin Uh, given for first three months, followed by rivaroxaban 10 milligram uh, after the th- after the three month therapy of aspirin versus uh, a roti- a standard of care therapy clopidogrel and aspirin for three months, followed by aspirin alone. Again, uh, this trial actually showed uh, uh, worse outcomes uh, with uh, rivaroxaban. So particularly, rivaroxaban increased bleeding, and uh, there was also increased risk of uh, thromboembolic complications as well as increased risk of death. so clearly using rivaroxaban was uh, was had a bad outcome and clearly only antiplatelet therapy again uh, is indicated post av and there is no role for uh, both rivaroxaban or apixaban uh, after uh, routine after av what is your current practice of uh, using lipid lowering drugs particularly statins in a group of patients who undergo av yeah so particularly when these patients uh, have associated coronary artery disease uh, we routinely give them on statin but i think uh, now there are some uh, studies coming up with the role of uh, lipoprotein lately maybe uh, you can elaborate more on uh, the role of uh, uh, using lipid therapy as well as uh, in patients who have elevated lipoprotein lately uh, in patients uh, who, who have atic stenosis as well as patients post stab Yeah, Dr. in Rahul, fact, uh, but before that, Rahul, do you do you use uh, statins uh, post AV, and is there a role in patients who do not have coronary artery disease? I mean, sure. Um, you know, no, not really. And I think you know some of the studies, and this has been borne out of the AHA discussions, is whether it's because of the pleiotropic effects of the statin, um, and and whether the the competing mortality risks in TAVA might dilute any positive effect of the statin itself. So it's hard to tease out. But no, routinely use it unless there's an indication for. In fact, uh, Singhu, well, I read an article uh, day before yesterday. They say in the Galantin and uh, Robas, uh, uh, they have found out the aortic valve area and the aortic valve velocity compared to the control arm and the arm where they given the Roswell statin, they showed positive effect. So this was the Dr. article I studied day before yesterday. Doctor Narsing has special no. Doctor Narsing has special interest in uh, lipidology, and let's hear for his views on uh, on the role of statin. Uh, yeah, can, can I share some slides? Can I share some slides yeah, now? Yeah, please, yeah, yeah. please, please, please. Now, oh, this is actually the recent publication which had appeared in American Heart Association, two thousand nineteen. It is about the usage of statin. and the mortality after the avid procedure for example the conclusions only i am trying to tell you that in an observational propensity matched analysis of avid patients that in use was associated with lower rates of cardiovascular and non cardiovascular mortality compared with no statin use in fact we had witnessed studies from 2016 17 and 18 indicating the usage of statin in people who had undergone avid their conflicting reports at up one particular society said no there is no need to use it the other society said no you have to use it acch tells you that people who are undergoing tavi procedure if they are more than 75 years old probably you need to have a good interaction with the patient and starting starting probably may not be harmful you can use it according to the decision what you are making that whatever is the dose that you are going to use whether the patient has been already having a statin therapy for a concomitant coronary artery disease he has to continue that in case he does not have a coronary artery disease he has only a pure aortic stenosis and the patient has undergone a tavi procedure i think there is an indication for use of statin which has shown that it reduces not only cardiovascular mortality but also non cardiovascular mortality as per the current evidence i think i should tell you something about the lipoprotein lipase which we are actually very very careful in advising this particular information all over medical patenty saying that the 
the life of root conjunctival lay is not little anymore because we have seen that it is associated with aortic stenosis, not only in people who have established coronary artery disease, where you have a problem of a premature coronary artery disease, persons who are seeking younger people in whom you don't have any other risk factor, who try to screen them for a little root conjunctival lay. That's a usual procedure which we adopt. But whereas it is a link with aortic stenosis has been totally forgotten by many of us, the genetically determined risk factor in calcific aortic stenosis, not only at the established one, even the, the precedent problem like the pro inflammatory action, pro calcific changes, and in addition, the calcium deposition occurs and the ectopic bone formation occurs at the AV valve, which probably restrict the valve mobility and it's connected. In fact, this is a good slide which tells you that elevated lipoprotein little air levels are probably increasing the calcification activity. It increases the faster progression in calcium score and faster hemodynamic progression and higher risk for aortic valve replacement and death. Having seen this, this is an important slide. If we remember this particular projection, I think probably we will probably change our approach in managing people with aortic stenosis. If you look at one area that is on the right side, L the the lipoprotein rutile has got a unique structure. They've got a LDL like particle, which has got a pro atherogenic activity. In addition, it also combines with an oxidized phospholipids, which are responsible for the occlusion and the aggravation of aortic stenosis. In fact, the LDL like particle with an APOP gets closely bound to APOA1 particle here, which is in the form of a crinkles. This APOA1 particle, which is available in the form of crinkles, are almost simulating that of the plasminogen, which reduces the fibrinolysis. So that by increasing the thrombogenicity, which is responsible not only for myocardial infarction, for stroke, as well as for narrowing the arteries, including the aortic stenosis, where the turbulent blood flow, probably at the site where the things are occurring as a result of thrombogenesis. I think the pro-atherogenic, pro-inflammatory, pro-thrombotic milieu are created with the unique structure of lipoprotein little a. In fact, there are a number of studies, 20 studies or so, which had again linked the lipoprotein little a with the calcific aortic stenosis. This is the genetic data which had clearly shown nearly about 7,000 individuals who were submitted for aortic CT scan, which had implicated the role of lipoprotein little a in the LPA locus. In fact, if you analyze the measurement of the lipoprotein little a, People who have more than 90th percentile have got double the risk of developing aortic stenosis. If they have 95th percentile, they have tripled the risk of developing aortic stenosis. The more than 50 milligrams is considered as above abnormal value. In fact, there are a number of studies like Astronema study, Salter study, Ring of Fire study that established the link between the aortic stenosis, AVR, and even cardiovascular death. I think we need to concentrate on this important parameter in all of our patients with aortic stenosis. Even at the time when they are asymptomatic, I think it is mandatory that they should be submitted for the screening of aortic um, and lipoprotein little a. Uh, what are the how does this lipoprotein little a well additated assays use isoform insensitive assays and fresh samples are required? There is no need for a genetic sampling. The strategy is to lower how to lower. The statins, in fact, if you look at the data, really about uh, there is an increase about five to seven percent of the levels of lipoprotein little a if you use only statin. But subsequent studies, recent studies have not shown this sort of increase. Niacin is actually there is no cardiovascular outcome data in spite of the fact that it reduces the lipoprotein little a levels. PCS can an inhibitor is very strong in reducing the lipoprotein little a levels. In fact, people who have the, the IPO function of PCSK9, in those individuals, there is actually less amount of the lipoprotein little a production, and they have less tendency for development of aortic valve stenosis. That has been linked now, and now people are now trying to do some studies with the usage of PCSK9 inhibitor, targeting mainly the lipoprotein little a. That's one important message, what I thought I should share with you. Aphrasis, of course, everybody knows about it. APOA antisense reduce the lipoprotein levels by 90%. The messenger RNA, small interfering messenger RNA, is the one that has helped us to understand better about the interaction of this particular molecule in reducing the lipoprotein little 
LDL levels, lipoprotein literally plus oxidized phospholipids above P, oxidized phospholipids above A. All the levels are coming down. Primary endpoints, secondary endpoints are all coming down. And the lesser levels of the lipoprotein literally came down by 50 milligram. There are no safety issues which have been seen with this particular molecule. Probably we are going to witness in the near future the usage of this small interfering RNA, which may probably target the hypoprotein delay. The usage of PCS cannon inhibitor again may play an important role in the reduction of hypoprotein delay. I think we should consider hypoprotein delay is not little anymore. We should always think that it is a deadly cholesterol, not only for the recurrence of events, but also for the initiation and the progression of iotic stenosis, including the calcific iotic stenosis. This is what I would like to uh, uh, give this information to the August audience consisting of surgeons as well as cardiologists. Thank you, Narsingan. Uh, from your uh, LPA, I will go to Narsiman. Narsiman, are you there? Narsiman? Can we? Much. Very much. I am very much here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Narsiman, you Can tell us... Can we stop sharing, sir? Can we stop yeah, sharing? You... You, you tell us, stop sharing, uh, Narsian, you stop sharing yeah, this slide. Yeah, 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 I will do it now, please, yeah. Yeah, uh, Narsian, Narsian, you please tell us your experience of ACE and the rhythm disturbance and the uh, blocks and then pacemaker, you know, because you got wide experience about the aortic stenosis. Even before TAVI comes, you know, you had, uh, do, you were doing a lot of work, good work on uh, aortic stenosis. You are experienced. Kindly share with us. Thank you so much. Uh, the interest in this uh, started in 90s when we reported a cohort of patients who died suddenly after aortic valve replacement. This was uh, data we collected in uh, uh, University of uh, Wisconsin. And uh, when we looked at it, most of them, they had a perfect valve replacement, unexpected sudden death due to rapid ventricular tachycardia. And the mechanism was uh, because of edema in the conduction system. It's not block, but uh, edema in the conduction system causes a re-entry and causes a phenomenon called as bundle branch re-entry. We reported this in circulation several years ago. And then in a, there are certain autopsy studies which looks at a more severe damage leads on to block Minor damage leads to non-sustained VT and sometimes rapid bundle branch re-entry VT. And uh, we are seeing the same thing progressing. One of the important thing is uh, calcium in the contralateral cusp. So if you have excess rigid calcium and the left cusp is not going to be yielding, most of the force is going to be transmitted on the contralateral cusp. And uh, as Daljit presented, we are uh, fine-tuning this, but uh, there's a lot of unknowns in this area. Okay. Uh, for the physician's think, point uh, of view... Yeah, uh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, please. Uh, Narsiman, for the physician's point of view, uh, is there any typical ECG finding in aortic stenosis? Suppose a young physician sees the uh, aortic stenosis. Is there anything which uh, we, they can get in from ECG, apart from echo? Uh, in the ECG, do you have any specific points you look for in aortic stenosis? Right. There are a couple of uh, things. Uh, when you see a patient pre-procedure in a person who is relatively asymptomatic mm -hmm. and has come with aortic stenosis, he has got a significant STT changes in the lateral leads. Then even if the patient's symptoms are minimal, we will have a very low threshold for sending these patients for either surgery or intervention. Uh, in, the, in the absence of coronary artery disease, it indicates severe subendocardial uh, ischemia in these patients. Similarly, if you see a significant LVH, what is known as Bayes syndrome, a, a fractionation or a fractionation of the QRS indicates there is certain degree of fibrosis which is already setting in in the ventricle. And I'll have a very low threshold for referring these patients for surgery, even if their uh, uh, gradients are borderline, uh, uh, my threshold may be a little lower. Similarly, when you do a TAVR or SAVR and these patients develop transient AV block, generally the block is infrahisian as uh, Daljit projected, and those are unpredictable and high-grade blocks. Again, uh, because of the unpredictability of this, we put a pacemaker. If these patients have a wide split P wave and their BNP remains elevated, they are at a high risk of 
developing atrial fibrillation, my threshold for starting Novax will be very low in such patients. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Uh, she is a specialist in uh, cardiac rehabilitation. Dr. Priya, can you highlight the importance of rehabilitation post travel How do you proceed and what are the advices that you give to these patients? Sure. Um, good evening, one and all. Uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Um, so looking at cardiac rehabilitation, uh, which is, I would say, a multidisciplinary kind of approach, uh, which includes exercise, there is supervised exercise, dietary modification, um, some amount of uh, health education, stress management and counseling. So it is uh, mul multidisciplinary and uh, the uh, indications for cardiac rehabilitation are expanding uh, on a daily basis. So there is a lot of, um, uh, it is a class one uh, LA indication in, we know that uh, in coronary artery disease and in revascularization procedures, uh, as well as in uh, valve replacements. So with TAVI becoming uh, uh, the routine uh, these days for uh, aortic valve replacements, um, it is, there is a lot of evidence to show that uh, uh, systematic and uh, scientifically approached cardiac rehabilitation program is very useful in improving the functional capacity of the patients, uh, as well as the health-related quality of life of those undergoing these rehab programs. And in addition to that, if they are um, having concomitant uh, cardiovascular uh, diseases like coronary artery disease or uh, um, other issues, uh, like just recently pointed out the uh, abnormal lipid levels, the dyslipidemias or the risk factors, uh, coexisting risk factors for cardiovascular diseases. So all of these patients have a very good improvement in their risk profile and their symptomatology uh, when they un undergo a structured cardiac rehab program. A structured rehab program would typically involve about 24 to 36 sessions um, of uh, supervised uh, rehab sessions. That is uh, on a week, weekly basis, about two to three sessions with the rehab team. And this goes on for about three to four months on an intensive basis after which they are put on a maintenance or uh, uh, you know, uh, frequent assessments or follow-up sessions. So the intensive program is typically about 36 sessions. And uh, all the data that we have of, uh, are right now of Western uh, population because cardiac rehabilitation itself is a growing field in India. We have been uh, pioneering it for about seven years now. And um, it's, it's interesting to see that uh, even the home-based program, so with the onset of the pandemic and since the last one and a half years, the home-based programs have been almost as efficacious and um, the results have been as good as the conventional uh, supervised center-based program. So we, are, um, we also have seen a lot of studies on the home-based cardiac rehab programs off late. So where the supervision is online and web-based, uh, of course, we cannot take the high-risk patients up for these home-based programs, but the low to intermediate-risk patients um, do fare very well with these home-based programs. So it's it's important to um, refer the post avi or the SAVR patients for uh, cardiac rehabilitation and to risk stratify them up front and then to uh, take them up for the rehab program and um, assess their uh, outcomes very systematically. So we have a few publications, but not specifically to TAVI, but I think with the building um, patient population where they're referred for cardiac rehabilitation post TAVI, we would be able to publish our own data um, very soon. Thank yeah, you. Bashi, now, now Bashi, uh, in your experience, you would have done a lot of CAPGs. After three or four years of CAPG, if you come across uh, I mean, aortic stenosis, will you submit them for uh, uh, TAVI or you will do valve replacement? I mean, I have uh, done uh, quite a number of, uh, depends upon the age of the patient, because uh, I had patients uh, who, are, who were physically fit for an open surgery. I do uh, an open valve replacement. People who are below 60 years, I have at least about uh, 25, 30 cases where I have done uh, aortic valve replacement. Myocardial preservation is a little different. I pull the patient and uh, that the because most of them will have functioning edema. So I have uh, excellent results with that. 
but uh, actually two patients uh, of mine underwent uh, TAVI, who had about bilateral mammary and five functioning graphs. Both are done about four years ago. Both are doing well. But uh, if the patient is fit, uh, you know, uh, I will definitely go for open surgery. Those who are, say, about, about 65, uh, 70, like that, definitely it is. I mean, doing this, those cases are not very easy. It's quite difficult to do a, a redo. Well, the tab is a really blessing for us, I would say, in this type of... And also, if the graphs are functioning, all the more easy for the interventionalist to not to worry too much about the coronary ischemia. Then, uh, Doc, in, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Doctor Hirmat, you are uh, you are uh, you are uh, experienced in this in the both the combined lesions. Uh, if it is an elderly, then definitely it goes for a TAVI or CABG elderly patients. And in younger patients, sir, uh, there's no second thought. CABG with aortic valve replacement itself will go ahead. Now, nursing end. A yeah. patient with um, uh, TAVI, who, uh, I'm sorry, not TAVI, aortic stenosis with hypertension, what would be the, your approach for the hypertension? What drug you will give? Ideal drug for uh, aortic stenosis with hypertension. I think the calcium channel blockers will be ideal in such situation. You won't prefer ACE inhibitor? There is no harm in giving it, provided the patient is uh, under the age of 55. Above and the age of 55, probably I may not prefer an ARB in this situation because they don't have much renin in their system. Okay. Rahul, uh, Rahul what is the Russian doll effect? I saw that in the presentation, uh, the other speaker was talking about Russian doll effect. What is Russian doll effect? So that's the idea where you have a valve and valve and valve. So let's say, for example, you have a surgical prosthesis, you do a valve and valve, and then the to have a prosthesis degenerates, then you need to put a valve in valve and you have, it's almost like that Russian doll of one another. But what, what is changing that game is that um, there is a valve um, that's the Inspiris valve from Edwards Life Sciences that has actually got these little pleats in it, which allows you to expand it. So it's almost like it's being prepared so that in the event that it deteriorates, you can put a valve in valve and actually kind of fracture it or expand it as opposed to what we're having to do now, which is really a brutally fracture these valves, which is obviously one not what they're designed for. Yeah, okay. Because it was interesting, you know, he says Russian doll effect. So I, I mean, I was just imagining what, what should be a Russian valve, I mean, doll, oh, correct. Okay, so anyway, a, can I ask a question? There's a question from audience. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Say this is the role of hybrid procedures. They want to know if uh, uh, any uh, minimally invasive CABG along with TAVI, has it been done in any situation? Uh, because uh, with the patients who have uh, left main with uh, aortic stenosis, left main disease with aortic stenosis, of course, uh, we do uh, uh, stent the left main and have done TAVI in uh, situations. Uh, most of the situations we do that. But we have not had a situation to uh, combine uh, surgery and TAVI together. I would like to uh, ask uh, any of you had experience in uh, doing a, a good procedure. I, I, I didn't have, I mean, of course, anybody with the coronary disease with aortic valve, I'll definitely do an open uh, yeah. surgery and, uh, and uh, you know, there is no point in doing minimally invasive. Anyway, we have to open the chest either through the side or the front. So I would definitely do a open valve replacement and do the CABG. Yeah. Unless the patient is you now very old. So for example, 80, 85 years old. Okay, uh, we can think of something, but I don't have personally any experience. No, no, but, but like what Singotwil asked, Will you ask the cardiologist to do TAVI and then do bypass at the same sitting? I will do that. Yeah, yeah, I will definitely do both together. In and also, PC uh, can be managed with the uh, stenting and uh, TAVI uh, simultaneously in the same sitting or can be in a staged manner. So very often we do that. Uh, I think there is no, no need to do a hybrid uh, in that situation. Yeah, yeah. And uh, would you give anti-failure treatment after a post-TAVI if the patient came with some... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, LV dysfunction because you are the, the talk is about post TAVI management. So, will you advise uh, anti failure as a good way? Yes, of course, we do the standard uh, heart failure management with uh, uh, all the medicines uh, like uh, and aldosterone antagonists, the ARNI, as well as now we have SGLT2 inhibitors, everything as, as uh, regular heart failure therapies instituted mm -hmm. post TAVI as well if they have symptoms of heart failure. But uh, how often, I mean, how, how long after you will uh, reduce or uh, uh, de-prescribe those drugs? Again, it depends on how fast the LV improves. Very often we see uh, 
the left ventricle improves even I mean, instantly after tavi we have seen improvement but it, most often it happens over a period of 3 to 6 months and then when the left ventricle function improves uh, we can taper or gradually stop these uh, the additional medications okay uh, narsingan you want to ask something narsingan nothing nothing i think we had an extensive discussion today yeah um, but uh, uh, rahul uh, rahul your guidelines you are saying about uh, iot your guidelines is same in everywhere or you have american guidelines or you know the, the guidelines in india or and the european is different so do you there, think there's uh, any any difference in india you think uh, anything to be uh, changed here that's what i think he wants to know Oh I see. So so I think you know the guidelines there are subtle differences between the European guidelines and the American guidelines. Um the I would say for the most part I think practice is very similar in both countries. Perhaps the bigger issue is availability and cost. Um in India of course you don't have the same extent of availability of all of the devices and cost is a bigger issue in consideration. We're able to do a lot more here because of the cost borne by the healthcare system. um but also by the hospital systems in terms of doing a lot of off label cases i think that's the key difference but in terms of practice which is guideline based it seems that uh it's very similar across all the countries thank you i think before we wind up uh, one one message from all the stalwarts bashi you have message to all our audience regarding the iotic stenosis and pavi and you know overall a drive home message one message from you No, I mean the the decision has to be taken in an individualized patient in our setup with the thank you with the yeah the doctor Hermit yeah case by selection of the cases that's very important because uh, we can't fix up for this particular age group that's very clear uh, not only now even the guidelines also say and even in class one uh, they are indicating in younger patients and as Rahul mentioned that. Uh, and the patients can be attempted wherein if their life span is defined less than 10 years and definitely can go for it out that's very clear yeah narsiban you will be giving us the practical problem guidelines for all the physicians right i think i think snows is as such we are just looking at the pyramid a very small segment of population i was quite impressed by what dr narsingan projected for every symptomatic aortic stenosis you are going to have probably 100 or 200 patients with mild aortic stenosis what walks in to the clinic as aortosclerosis we pass it on as nothing it is a missed opportunity by the medical community if you don't interfere then because now you have a better understanding of the disease the valve calcification the risk factors which accelerate the progression of the disease and uh, i think there is a golden opportunity to slow down the progression of disease which is going to translate into millions millions of uh, severe disease being prevented thank you narsimhan rahul you are uh, message yeah i think tavers become so simple and easy to do that uh, we have to be careful that it's not about can we do taver but in some patients should we do taver so being careful and judicious and not just implanting valves in everyone thank you uh, nursing and you are you are comment uh, lipoprotein literally should find a place in the lipid profile which you are asking from uh, for any sort of uh, uh, problems either it uh, premature coronary artery disease or patients who suffer from aortic stenosis even at the asymptomatic stage you need to ask them to go for a lipid profile which contains lipoprotein literally This is a strong message. Whenever you ask for lipid profile, please include little a also. That is the message. Uh, Singo Duel, your final comment, and then we can wind up. So, as as discussed by everyone, I think it's individualized tailor made therapy. I think we should discuss in the heart team which is the best options for that particular patient, and then plan the treatment. And again, anatomy also makes a difference. We might have now more challenging anatomies like bicuspid valve. which again we need to uh, study uh, the ct and uh, depending on that uh, plan exactly what can be done for that particular patient and uh, again post tavi management again is uh, very important to plan so again uh, again is tailor made uh, depending on the need of the patient the bleeding risk versus the ischemic risk or the thrombotic risk uh, decide the uh, appropriate uh, therapy as well as uh, with cardiac good cardiac rehabilitation a use of statins and all that will be effectively uh, be, be do good to these uh, patients over long term so i think uh, uh, it's already 8:35 so i think rahul is ready to go for the hospital and uh, <laughs> I, i i think it must be uh, 8 o'clock or 8 8 am in the morning there rahul correct it's 8 am 
yeah so uh, all dr. of you dr muruganathan what is your one line message no i i love to conclude and then say one line <laughs> 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 so i thank the uh, faculties from abroad and also our uh, stalwarts like bashi hirmat and of course not to forget priya chokalingam chokalingam as uh, a daughter you know you are also you know coming to the cardiac rehabilitation that's a very good uh, feel and in this uh, post covid you know uh, i mean covid situation uh, don't forget about the other things you know we, we are all talking about covid covid and we don't uh, concentrate other things also even the uh, river of back saban and epixaban there are a lot of theories going on about the covid also then people prefer epixaban than rovaxaban i don't know why and uh, they are all giving uh, for covid so you will have to have knowledge about the covid definitely but you should have knowledge about other diseases also and as narsimhan said as a clinician approach properly start from the clinical examination it's a forgot or not history is very important plus of course go by step by step ecg echo and then echo also you send it to a specialist to find out the uh, the nitty gritty the five points about echo what uh, singo to well said at last time so all that is important and the physician must know what all the options available for various uh, diseases so one of the option is tavi now everybody knows even the surgeons recommend tavi that means it's safe procedure good procedure only thing by many procedures the cost will come down sooner or later the tavi will be very very simple as uh, Ta- singo will said it was an excellent program for the last 3 weeks A really tavi is simplified and we are having this recorded version in the website so all of you are who have not uh, listened to it you can come and you know ask us we'll put it in the website and you can download and see so once again i thank uh, every speaker rahul uh, sanj uh, narsingan priya uh, bashi hirmat and narsimhan as usual uh, you rocked and you are uh, you are junior also and one thing about narsimhan always respects his junior whenever you know he gives a presentation he will make sure that his junior is promoted so that's how you know he promotes the juniors very well thank you narsimhan uh, thank you all and thank you <laughs> the uh, supporters who have helped us for this wonderful program and we'll uh, look forward to meet to all of you in a different uh, 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 setup in a different situation thank you very much good night and namaste thank take you. care stay thank safe you. take care stay safe yes thank you good night thank you bye thank you thank you